by faith, blessed assurance. Good morning and welcome to Faith United Methodist Church's Easter service. We're so happy you could join us virtually this morning. I will begin with the call to worship. I will be leading the liturgist portion and will also be reading the congregational response. We come to this moment seeking Jesus in the familiar story of faith. Do not meet us only now, O living Christ, but surprise us with resurrection power in all the places of our lives. We gather to sing and pray the story we know by heart, a story of loving triumph and powerful grace. This story of Alleluia means great joy, the one who lives and the one who witness to this new life in all the places of our lives. We rejoice and thank you for the life of your son, resurrection by the power of your loving, vibrant spirit. Let this same spirit fill us that we may know the truth of resurrection in all the places of our lives. We join our hearts in song and sing, Alleluia, gracious Jesus, for Christ is living and so are we. Alleluia indeed. Thank you, Renee. And good morning from Pastor Brian LeBaron. Happy Easter! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so we have this access to God through Christ. And so let us now begin in a word of prayer. Lord, on this Easter day, marked both by sorrow and joy, our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need include both heartfelt lament and fervent praise. God, our sanctuary, we lament that we cannot gather today for public worship, that death stalks the church and world, and that our sorrows and fears blunt our songs of hallelujah. Show the church your mercy, for your mercy endures forever. And yet around the globe, we praise you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, 
for our baptismal washing in his life, for your presence come to us in the word, and for hope that the gospel brings. Lord, we praise you for the dispersed church in each and every home and place where the church is being celebrated today. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God that you are always with us, never leaving us or forsaking us. God, our creator, we lament that our lifestyles have harmed your creation and that our efforts to repair your earth are now postponed. Show the earth your mercy, for your mercy endures forever. And yet here in the north, we praise you for the beauty of the natural world, for the springtime flowers and budding trees, for the soil and the rain that begin to nourish the planting of the crops. And we praise you for your earth and creation. Thanks be to God. Lord God, our overseer, our governor, we lament that war and violence still rage, that countless people suffer injustice, and the plight of the refugee seems beyond solution, that appropriate governmental action is delayed and inadequate. Show the world your mercy, for your mercy endures forever. And yet, Lord, as we look around, we praise you that there is peace on our streets, that some elected officials and many aid agencies are devoting themselves to save the people and to share our food, that we are given connection to friends and family through technology. And we praise you for community. Thanks be to God. Lord God, our great physician, we lament all who suffer, those who name in our prayers before you now. But especially, we lament the coronavirus and its incalculable suffering, the many thousands sick, the fear instilled, the loss of employment, the cancellation of plans, the overflow in hospitals, the scarcity of supplies, the exhaustion of the medical staff. Lord, show all the needy your mercy, for your mercy endures forever. And yet, Lord, we praise you for health and well-being, wherever it thrives, for the dedication of medical workers, for the goodwill of volunteers, for the generosity of benefactors, and for the comfort we receive from the power of the resurrection. We praise you for healing, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. God, our everlasting arms, mother us in our heartache and distress, Receive now our personal laments and help each of us to praise your name. And we praise you for hearing our prayers. Thanks be to God that we can call on you in times like these. For your God, our life eternal. Lord, we do lament the thousands dead and the sadness of all who mourn. And we remember before you all who have died in the faith. Show to all humanity your mercy, for your mercy endures forever. And yet we gather together in dispersed places, yet joining in our alleluias, and we praise you on this Easter day for your promise of an endless banquet of joyous life in your presence when diseases and sorrows will be no more. For in life and death, we praise you. Thanks be to God. And God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, who are the source of life, word of salvation, and power of mercy into your hands, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your compassionate might for the sake of him who died and rose for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today, it's going to be our uh, mutual edification to share in worshipful uh, music and singing brought to us by the Sounds of Good News, uh, featuring Carl and Diana Cole and Dr. Jihei Kim. And they are going to uh, share with us uh, some blessed uh, hymns and songs and encourage you to listen along as they take us into the throne room of God. 
with praise and thanksgiving on this Resurrection Sunday. I'm Bishop Sally Dick, and I'm here to greet you in the name of the risen Lord. It's a strange Easter morning for most of us as we gather in our homes instead of in our congregations. But the risen Christ is with us all. It may have been a very strange Easter that first dawn as well. Listen to the Gospel of John as it tells us the story of the first Easter morning. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was yet dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed they didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head 
and one at the foot. The angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? She replied, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I'll go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me for I haven't yet gone to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then she told them what he said to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bishop Sally Dick, for bringing the good news in the Gospel of John to us this day. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. This is a joy-filled proclamation, a mystery we don't always get, can't get, weren't designed to get, yet it rings true in our world weary, in our sin-sick souls, in our hearts broken by the coronavirus pandemic and its implications. Our world's turned upside down. And we look around and see many, many things we've never seen before. And yet, we are called as God's people in the midst of these unprecedented times to still not only look around, but to look up and find our strength from God on high. So, hallelujah, hallelujah. We can't say it enough. It is the balm in Gilead, the water to a parched tongue, the stream in the desert, the light at the end of the tunnel. Hallelujah, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. How different this joyful exclamation is from the words the risen Jesus heard from Mary Magdalene at the tomb, where she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. You see, Mary, she was caught up in some serious grief and, frankly, trauma. Her mind was stuck in a frantic loop. Where is he? Where is he? Where did he go? Where is his body? The first time she says this is after she runs to the disciples' safe house to report this newest insult. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. The second time, she says she can't even see straight because of the wave of disorienting grief. She has turned in on herself. You've been there, I've been there, we've been there collectively in these recent days. This most unprecedented holy week we have walked through where not only do we remember the, the suffering and the passion and death of the Christ, we look around and have seen the suffering and death of thousands as a result of the coronavirus. And we too, even in our own lives, lament and mourn the temporary suspension of living life as we've known it. Us also being in a safe house, like the disciples gathered 
in safety and sheltered in place. So in this second time, she's turned on herself, Mary Magdalene, and she misses the angels dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been laid. Woman, they ask, why are you weeping? They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Then she senses another person behind her and turns around. Her grief is like a centripetal force, turning her in on herself, blinding her to the capital R, reality. Trapped in grief and thinking nothing would ever be okay again. She assumes the man is the gardener, maybe even thief. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. (laughs) The first words spoken to the resurrected Christ certainly were a long way from how we greet him today. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. You see, Mary was caught up in crucifixion vision. Crucifixion vision afflicts most of us much of the time. It is a way of seeing and perceiving the world that makes us think that sin and death are in charge. Crucifixion vision tricks us into wanting us to go back to the past, to the good old days as though the human condition has taken a new dramatic plunge off the deep since we were children. Crucifixion vision is what fuels greed. We can never have quite enough to really be financially secure, can we? And then we are faced with the millions that have become unemployed in these past weeks. Yet, we do what we can. We help with the food pantry. We look after our neighbors and pray and hope and plan and find what God would have us to do to help our neighbor. Yet, when we are in crucifixion vision, it is what binds us in sadness when we take everything personally and think that We're responsible in some way for all others' well-being. We can only do so much during these times of staying at home and looking after our, our households and our loved ones. Crucifixion vision assumes, ah, nothing's ever going to change. The partisan divide is too great. The world is divided between the elites and the deplorables, between the haves and the have-nots, between the workers and the owners, between the educated and the uneducated, between the worthy and unworthy. Crucifixion vision sees the world is filled with winners and losers, firsts and lasts, We better do anything and everything we can to be winners. Crucifixion vision assumes death is really the end, so we better stuff our lives with so much stuff, so much pleasure, so much happiness as we can, and try and postpone death as long as possible by whatever means are available. And Mary was caught up in crucifixion vision. And we can understand that. We feel it at times. Jesus had died. She was in a blaming mode. Who took his body? She was paralyzed and stuck. She couldn't get up and leave the scene like Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. She didn't have access to wonder and have curiosity about, why are the linen clothes rolled up so nicely in the corner of the tomb? Mary was trapped by crucifixion vision like most of us are most of the time. So much so, she couldn't see the angels right in front of her. 
Mary couldn't even recognize the resurrected Christ in her midst before her until until she heard her name, Mary, Mary. Don't hold on me, but go to my brothers and say to them, I have, am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. And then her crucifixion vision fell away. Like the scales on St. Paul's eyes, she saw for the first time with resurrection vision. Resurrection vision is bigger than crucifixion vision. It overtakes it. It redeems it. Resurrection vision is looking away from ourselves and all of our problems to take in the beauty of a flower or the sunrise or even the subtle sensation of breath. <sighs> Inhale and exhale, giving us life. Resurrection vision enables us to trust that all things work together for good for those who are called to God's purposes. Resurrection vision knows that joy comes in the morning even though weeping is spending the night. Resurrection vision looks around and even though we see the distress, death, and devastation of the coronavirus, we see that out of all this calamity, God within us will once again rise up and we will continue to call him blessed. Recent studies have shown in surveys that people are praying more than ever before, both those that are sacred and those that are secular. You know that with resurrection vision, all things are possible. You know that love wins. You know that there are no more haves and have-nots, Republicans or Democrats, mountain people or beach people, rich or poor, slave or free, Jew or Greek, black or white. We are all one in Christ. And God loves us with an everlasting love and desires to give us gifts of grace and mercy. But here is the really good news if you can't seem to fix your vision, if the optometrist is closed and the readers are sold out at Walmart and the ophthalmologist isn't on your insurance plan, God will fix it for you. God will seek you out just as he did with the lost sheep, the slaves in Egypt, the woman at the well. God will seek you out and remind you that you don't have to. You can't, in fact. You weren't meant to just hold on because God is holding on to you. God is drawing you up from the grave, offering you free cataract surgery or just an updated eyeglass prescription, whatever it is you need to see straight, to see with resurrection eyes. Now, it might take a while for you to see as God sees, to love as God loves. Remember that story in Mark where Jesus spits into his hands and smears it on the blind man's eyes? At first, the people looked like trees. So Jesus laid his hands on him again. And then his sight was clear. It might take a little time, a few tries, but my dear friends... Rest assured, God is at work in our midst, meeting you where you are, holding you, healing you, and indeed the whole creation, so we can see through resurrection eyes, even through this time of trial and tribulation, 
But we are promised that as we persevere through trial and tribulation, God continues to develop perseverance and joy within us to stay us through life's journey. A journey that goes through the hosannas and triumphs of life. A journey that leads us down a road, even at times a road of despair and suffering and death, but a road that eventually leads not only into the tomb, but up out of the tomb. And so let us look for resurrection in our hearts, in our lives, in our church, and in our community. Indeed, the world. For we know that in the cycle of life, out of death comes new hope, new life, resurrection. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we look around in these troubling times and we see that which afflicts us, stirs us, wearies us. And in the midst of this Garden of Gethsemane time for humanity, we pray to you that you would earnestly hear us and listen. And then through the midst of all this suffering, that you would bring redemption, that you would bring resurrection and new life and vitality to us as we move forward on this Easter day and beyond. And so we thank you for Jesus Christ who lived, died, and rose again for our sake, forgiving us our sins, accepting us, and giving us the gift of eternal and abundant life in you. May all who listen and see the service today be blessed and encouraged in their hearts that you will lift them up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, some special music with the sounds of good news. When they laid him in the tomb, were you there? Were you there? When he rose up from the grave, were you there? Oh, 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 oh. 
the dark domain And he lives forever with his saints to reign He arose, he arose Hallelujah, Christ arose He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today Walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Yes, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. That was tremendously uplifting music. Thank you uh, for your ministry uh, to the Cole family and to Dr. G. Hay Kim. Well, as we go from this service, let us go as those that have been fed from the shepherd, guided along in our hearts and in our lives. May we continue to have the vision of the resurrection in a dying world, that we may be the salt and light and love in action as the church dispersed into the community beyond these walls, into the walls of the homes and the places of life. May we continue to find strength for the journey ahead through our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may God bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and continue to keep you in his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, let us enjoy the postlude. Yes, now I'm happy. Yes, now 
I'm happy.